Well, we are journeying through the New Testament. Um, if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we as a church body are reading through the entire New Testament this year. It only takes five chapters a week. We just finished our second week, which was Matthew uh, 6 through 10. And we read through each week, and then we come uh, to that section of Scripture, and we look at a portion of that. This morning, our message comes from the closing verses of Matthew chapter 9. While you're turning there, let me mention that if you ordered a, a New Testament reading plan and you've not picked it up, you ordered a journal, they are out in the lobby on a table with your name on it. If you did not, you didn't know about this and you didn't order, there are enough copies that you can go by and pick up one that doesn't have a name on it and you can, you can join us in that. Let me also mention the families. There are family devotions, one a week. We don't expect you to try to wrangle your kids every night of the week, but one a week. And these also are on the countertops uh, out in the lobby. You can pick those up and have that uh, with your family. Matthew chapter 9, we'll be jumping in at verse 35. If you were looking through a photo album of, of Jesus' three years in ministry, Matthew 9, 35 would probably just be, it's a short section, just be a little snapshot, maybe tucked away in the corner of a, of a page of that photo album. But what we're about to read in Matthew 9, although it's a small snapshot, it, it's a transition taking place in the ministry of Jesus. And this transition has huge implications for the advancement of the gospel. Uh, you might consider this, and it probably is, as far as chronologi chronologically, it probably is, but you might consider this the midpoint of Jesus' ministry. Jesus has been teaching and preaching and performing miracles of compassion. The disciples have been with him, but they've just been observing. Occasionally, they would pull away after a season of ministry, and they would kind of debrief. And so they're, they're learning about the ministry. They're observing their learning. But now we're coming to the phase of discipling these men. You see, the task is too great because Jesus is in humanity at this point. He's in a human body. The task is too great. He can't do it alone. He's been preparing them, and now he's about to send them out. And a transition is going to take place. They're going to do more of the work of the ministry. They're going to be out there advancing the cause of the gospel. So read with me in Matthew <clears throat> chapter 9, beginning of verse 35. It says, And Jesus went through all, throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then chapter 10 and verse 1. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And then what you see in verses 2 through 4 is a listing of the 12. And then that first phrase in chapter 10 and verse 5 very simply says, these 12 Jesus sent out. All right, so here's the picture. Here's what's happening. We see in verse 35, it says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and all the villages. We know from the historian Josephus that in Galilee, there are about 204 uh, cities or towns and villages. A city would be a big uh, walled-in city like Jerusalem, and a town or village would be much smaller population, not, not a wall around it, a lot more rural. But Josephus tells us there were three, or 204 of these and 3 million people in the area just around Galilee. So Jesus is out. He's meeting people wherever they are. He's constantly out. He's engaging people. In fact, the words in Greek, the words went throughout, refer to a constant, unceasing effort. He was going all the time. He was expending all his energy in engaging people. Verse 35 tells us what he did when he engaged them, three key elements to his ministry. First, it says that he was teaching. Now, every Every town, every village, no matter how small, anywhere there was a, a population of Jewish people, there was a synagogue. When they came back from the Babylonian captivity, they began to set up these synagogues. The temple had been destroyed. Well, the synagogue literally was, was a school. It was a place that they went uh, to be taught. And they gathered on the second day of the week, and they gathered on the fifth day, and they gathered on the Sabbath, and then, of course, any feast or festivals. And, and listen to the order of a service in the synagogue. This is just like what we do today. First, they would have a time of thanksgiving and blessing. 
just like we do as we sing songs of thanks and songs of praise to the Lord as we gather for worship. They'd have a time of prayer. Then there'd be a time where someone would get up and, and read the Scripture. One of the teachers would read the Scripture. They'd read a section from the law, from Moses. They'd read a section from the prophets. And then they would interpret it for the people. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The people spoke Aramaic, so they would interpret or explain what it said. After that, there would be a sermon or a word of exhortation to those who were gathered there. And then finally, they would finish with a, a benediction or a, a prayer blessing before they left. Same pattern that we use. Uh, we believe in the church, it's vitally important. The most important part of that service is, is to teach the meaning of Scripture. The time of thanksgiving and blessing, the time of worship, prepares our hearts to receive from the Lord, and then we teach the meaning of Scripture. So verse 35 says he was teaching. Secondly, it says he was proclaiming. The word proclaim means to, to herald or to announce or to make a, a, a public proclamation. That didn't occur in the synagogue. That occurred out. That occurred on the streets and the highways, on the hillsides. That occurred when Jesus would encounter people out working the fields, uh, anywhere that they were in a village, anywhere that people were outside of the religious environment, the gospel was proclaimed. Everywhere Jesus went, he announced that the kingdom of God was coming, and then he told people how they could enter the kingdom of God. You know what we would call that today? We'd call that evangelism. And do you see the pattern there and the model there for us they gathered in the synagogue for instruction, but where did they go to evangelize? They scattered, they went out. Dr. Roy Fish, the late Dr. Roy Fish, used to say that evangelism in the church is terribly, it's like fishing in a bathtub. It's terribly convenient, but you don't catch much. We don't evangelize in here. I mean, you may bring lost friends or, or associates or, or family members here, and they're going to hear the gospel, but typically evangelism occurs as we scatter. We come together to be taught, and then we scatter to proclaim the gospel. Verse 35 says he was teaching, he's proclaiming. Thirdly, you see there, it says that, that he was healing. Now, I don't know that Matthew listed this thirdly for a reason, but I would say it's good he listed it thirdly because really it's, it's third in importance. The miracles and the healing were not the main thing. If you read through this week in chapters 6 through 10, you notice that in chapters 8 and 9, there's miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus did. There was the healing of the, the leper. There was uh, Peter's mother-in-law who had been sick, the centurion servant, the demon-possessed man, the paralytic, the dead girl, the sick woman. All of these miracles. Now, those are just samples of the kind of miracles Jesus did. All of them could not be recorded. In fact, in the very last chapter of the Gospel of John, the last verse of the last chapter, John says, listen, the world would not contain the books if we tried to write down all of the things that Jesus did. But the miracles, understand the miracles were not the main deal. Jesus didn't come just to do miracles. He came to teach. He came to proclaim. The miracles simply validated the Gospel message, validated who Jesus was. Why? Because his message was very different. His message was not like that. It was, it was actually contrary to the message of the religious leaders of his day. In fact, the religious leaders looked down on him. He's not a rabbi. He's not even been trained. And so the miracles convinced the people that he was God and that he had authority. You know, it's interesting. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, never denied the miracles that Jesus did. They couldn't deny it. Everybody saw it. So they didn't deny the miracles, but they denied the source. They said that Jesus did it because he had the power of Satan or Beelzebub. So Jesus went about, verse 35, he was teaching, he was proclaiming, he was healing. Verse 36 very simply says this, he saw the crowds. Now that saw is an important word. You know, Jesus saw the crowds because he was looking, right? But let me also say to you, you can look without seeing. How many of you wives recognize that you're married to someone who can look without seeing? You know what I'm talking about, right? Where's my son? All of our families here this weekend. My son Jordan, I, it skipped me, I'm, I'm perfect at this, but <clears throat> my son Jordan, being a male, has trouble seeing. When he was a boy, he'd holler down from his room, Mom, I can't find whatever, my shoes, my backpack, whatever. She said, that's fine, but if I come up there and find it, it's mine for 24 hours. Well, miraculously, suddenly he was able to see. He'd been looking all over his room, but he couldn't see. Listen, you can look and not see. 
In Mark 8, there's a, there's a story of Jesus healing a blind man. You may remember the story. He, he touched the man, and the man was able to see, but when Jesus asked, what can you see? He said, I see people, but, but I see them as trees walking. His vision was blurry, so Jesus had to touch him a second time. That miracle was actually a rebuke to the disciples. He was showing them, hey, guys, you can see, you have vision, but your vision is not yet what it needs to be. You, you haven't got it. I wonder how many of us need a touch from Jesus to help us see, especially when it comes to the people around us. You know, a lot of times we don't even look. We have our head down. We walk by. Much like the priest and the Levite in the story of Good Samaritan. We don't want to look. We, have, we avoid people. Or we look over them or we look through them. You ever been at a function or a gathering and somebody's talking to you and you can tell they're looking through you and looking over you? They don't care. How about this? You ever do this? I'm admitting my own faults here, but you ever do this? Somebody standing on a street corner or somewhere else or even within the church, some person that you know is a needy person headed your way and you're saying this in your mind, don't make eye contact. <laughs> right? So what do we see when we look at people? We might see their color. We might see their socioeconomic status. We might see their situation. We might see their problems, the messiness in their life. It's the question is, can we look at them at, like Jesus did? Can we, can we see their spiritual potential? Or, or when we look at them and, and we see the incredible needs they have, could we possibly envision that God might use us to, to meet those needs? In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul, in that, sec, in that fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, talking about the ministry we have as believers, the ministry of reconciliation, Paul says about himself that he was compelled to share the gospel because of what Christ had done for him, because of Christ's willingness to love him and, and to die for him. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, he says this, talking about recognizing what Christ had done for him, he says this, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You know what he's saying? I, I can't look at people anymore from a human perspective when I understand what Christ has done. I can't look through temporal eyes and look at people and think, well, how well do they perform or what are they worth or, or, or are they like me or is their life kind of messy? I can't look at them that way when I understand the eternal perspective. Our willingness to advance the gospel should affect what we see. Let me say that a, a more simple way. Our business affects our vision. Let's suppose that you were going out on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon drive, and let's suppose that you're a painter. You know what you notice as you drive by houses and different buildings? Paint job. What if you're a landscaper? You notice the landscape. If you're an architect, you, you look at the architecture. Your business affects what you see. And so the question for us is, as followers of Christ, what's our business? What's your business? What, what do you see when you look out at the community where you live? When we were working down into the interior of Mexico and also in Peru, we would take teams in and the first trip, we would always make sure that we had adequately covered, adequately covered the area where we were working by prayer walking. And, and part of prayer walking was help people understand you're not just walking down the street praying, you're walking down the street praying with your eyes open. And I don't, I don't mean your eyes open just so you don't trip and fall. You're praying with your eyes open to see what you need to pray about. As you're walking through these little villages, you're looking to see What's hanging on the clothesline? That tells you something about who's in that house. You're looking to see if there are toys in the yard. You're looking to see if there are farm implements uh, leaning against the side of the, the house. What do we see? Verse 36. He was out among the people. He saw them. And what did he see? He saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Your translation may say that they were faint and distressed. Uh, in, in the Greek, those words harassed and helpless or faint and distressed are describing not a one-time thing, but a, a continual condition. 
What do the words mean? The first word, harassed, in the Greek means this. Torn, mangled, whipped, beaten harshly, skinned, mutilated, and battered. And then the helpless word simply means they were exhausted, they were worn out after being beaten and and, and battered. They were thrown down. And so the picture Jesus has is, he, he describes as he looks at these people, he pictures them as a flock of sheep on the hillside. And wild animals have come and, and, and ravaged the flock and attacked the flock. And there was no shepherd there to protect them. And after the attack was over and they'd been mangled and beaten and skinned and mutilated and, and thrown down, there's no shepherd there to pick up the pieces. There's no shepherd to bind up their wounds. There's no shepherd to lead them to safety. And that's what he saw when he saw the people. And listen, I, I don't know if you, you would conceive this, but in my mind, that's a picture of our culture and the condition of people in our culture. They may not look like that with our physical eyes, but with our spiritual eyes, we would see that they are harassed and they are helpless like sheep without a shepherd, and they need someone to come along and, and with compassion bind up their wounds and lead them to safety. Go back to verse 36 and look at the phrase I skipped. He saw the crowds. He saw their harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he had seen them. He had observed their condition. But, but what was it that made him do something? He was moved by compassion. Now, in verse 35, we mentioned that that the miracles of healing validated the gospel, but there's a second reason for these miracles, and I call them the miracles of compassion. The second reason is Jesus was trying to demonstrate to the people the loving and caring heart of God. You see, the Pharisees had not taught them that God was compassionate and sympathetic and loving and, and, and filled with kindness. They hadn't taught them that. And the Greeks, all of their gods, the Greeks would describe their gods with one word, apathetic. Their gods didn't care about them. They they knew that. And so Jesus came not only to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, he didn't just teach the word and, and proclaim the gospel. He touched people where they were hurting. He was sympathetic and he was caring. His actions, he was trying to teach them about God. You know that most people in our culture today don't know that God is a compassionate God. And if you study the world religions, you'll find something very interesting, and that is this. Our God is the only God that has compassion. No other gods in any world religions have the compassion that our God has. And what I'm saying to you as a church is that we have to understand the need for compassion, for people to see compassion, if they're going to truly understand the gospel. That's why, you know, some of you have been on these international mission trips with us. That's why we do so many things of serving people and meeting their needs. It's not because we practice a social gospel where we just take care of people's needs and hope they do okay. No, we do that to open the door to the gospel message. We run a medical clinic. We don't just take care of their needs. Every person that comes through that clinic, before they leave, hears the message of the gospel. They hear it after their needs have been taken care of. Because they understand that we are serving a compassionate God and we are serving them in compassion because that's who God is. You remember what Paul said in in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak with tongues of men and angels but have not love, what am I doing? I'm just making a bunch of noise. Paul says, without love, I am nothing. So Jesus had compassion. You know that Jesus understood our suffering because of his humanity. You think about that. God is a compassionate, loving God, but then God takes on a human body, and so he has the personal experience of physical pain. He has the personal experience of rubbing up against people who are needy while he's in a human body. What motivated Jesus when he saw these crowds was was compassion. Now, I don't know how you define compassion, but I, but I think for most of us, maybe our, our, our definition's a little bit shallow. Compassion to us means that, that we feel sorry for someone. Or we kind of look at their situation and say, oh, I mean, that's a shame. And then we move on. The Greek word for compassion is splank nizomai. Would you say that with me? Let me, let me give it to you a bit at a time. <laughs> splank. 
Ni, ni. zo, zo. my. Splunk ni zo my. That just sounds messy, doesn't it? You made a mess of it when you said it. You know, it sounds messy because it is. That Greek word in talking about confession refers to the bowels. I'm just telling you. I'm not making this up. It means to feel something in the, in the bowels or the intestines or, or the stuff in the middle. When, when the Greeks felt something very deeply, something that brought them pain, they expressed that hurt or that pain in their midsection. Now, if you think about it, it makes a lot more sense than, than what we do. We talk about the heart, right? Oh, that just really hurt my heart, or that blessed my heart. But where do you feel emotion? You, you don't have butterflies in your heart, do you? You have them where? In your stomach. Now, man, I'm not suggesting that you go home to tell, tell your wife this evening that you love her with all of your bowels. I'm not suggesting that at all. <laughs> Just saying they had a little bit better way of expressing the emotion. Okay, so here's Jesus, God in a bod. He sees the condition of the people. He's a loving, caring, compassionate God. You know, when you put God, who's that loving and that caring and that compassionate, far beyond what we ever would be, when you put him in a body and he sees that kind of need, that's going to wreak havoc on his body. Jesus literally was, was physically sick, sickened by, by what he saw. And today you and I are Jesus to our culture. And, and I've come to recognize if the condition of, of, of the people in our culture who don't know Christ, if their condition doesn't disturb me, doesn't move me with compassion, I better be alarmed about my own relationship with the Lord. We are called, all of us, not just pastors, to minister, to proclaim the gospel out of love and out of compassion we're called to explain the gospel out of hearts that are broken over the condition of the loss. Now, of course, Jesus' concern, his compassion, was not just about their physical needs. It was about their, their spiritual need. And again, we meet physical needs to open the door to spiritual needs. Jesus' primary mission is very simple. He came to seek and save the lost. It wasn't about the miracles, it wasn't about the, the compassionate miracles, it was about getting the gospel message across, but he understood that people needed to know that God loved and cared for them if they were going to believe the eternal message of the gospel. Well, so what does he do? Verse 37 and 38, he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, I want you to understand that harvest, that word harvest has two facets to it. Most uh, commentators would say the word harvest here is referring to uh, when, when he says the harvest is plentiful, the abundant number of people who need the gospel, who are ripe for harvest, they're ready for the gospel, someone just has to go out and share with them. But understand in Scripture that harvest also refers to judgment. And you'll see that repeatedly through Scripture, that the word harvest is referring to the judgment that's going to come at the end of time. In fact, you remember the parable that Jesus told about the man who planted wheat, and he had this wheat crop, and his laborers come into him one day and say, hey, all these weeds have sprung up in the crop. And the landowner said, well, clearly an enemy came during the night and, and sowed weeds in the crop. And so the laborers say, well, do you want us to pull all the weeds up? And he said, no. You may pull some wheat, leave them, let them grow together, and at the harvest time, we'll bundle up the wheat and put it into my barn, and the weeds we will bundle up and throw into the fire. Harvest is also a picture of, of judgment. Judgment is coming, and that's why Jesus told them to pray, and you notice he said, pray earnestly. There's going to be, for those who are not in Christ, great grief and great sorrow. And when Jesus saw these people who didn't know him, who didn't hear, hadn't heard the gospel message, when he saw them, he saw not only their current problem, he saw the eternal perspective. The harvest is, is the mission field, and the harvest is the final judgment. And he's calling the disciples to pray for more workers to get out into that harvest. 
Paul, again, back in 2 Corinthians 5, in that chapter on our ministry of reconciliation, Paul said this, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Understanding the judgment that is going to fall when, when harvest time comes for our world, understanding the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, we, we beg men, we plead with men to be reconciled with God because of the harvest that is to come. So Jesus says to them, pray earnestly. You know, when we really get the picture of the harvest, of the judgment that's coming, when we really see the people around us in our community and our, our family and our friends and our coworkers and our uh, people we go to school with, when we see the condition those people are in, when that really comes to us and we get the picture, we're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to feel like we got to hurry up and, and we got to do something. we got to get busy. we got to come up with a plan. But he didn't say any of that. What did he say to do? He said to, to pray. Why? Because we can't do anything apart from prayer. We, we don't have the plan. We don't have a clue. Prayer is the, the program and the plan and the work. It starts there. That's why we're committed to praying for these 350-plus names, praying for those who are trying to reach a friend or a, a neighbor with the gospel. But look what he said, pray. He doesn't say pray for the lost, does he? He says pray for laborers. Okay, now, he's talking to the disciples. You think they know who the laborers are? It's them. Pray for laborers. He is saying pray for more laborers, but he's also saying pray for yourself. So here's what might happen. You turn in a name a couple of weeks ago, and you begin to pray for someone to get the gospel to your friend or your loved one. And you keep praying. And you pray consistently, and you pray fervently. And while you're praying for the gospel to get to that friend or loved one, you have this thought. Maybe I should take the gospel to them. That's why Jesus told them to pray for the laborers, to pray for themselves that they will be burdened enough that they will do something to get the gospel out to that friend or loved one. I always think about the old deacon. The pastor told the story of one of his men, this old deacon, and every time the pastor would call on him to pray at the end of the service, he would always finish his prayer with, Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger. One night, old deacon's called on to pray. He's praying that prayer. Lord, touch the unsaved. And then he just stops, and it's silent. And he gets uncomfortable. And finally, the pastor looks, wondering, has this guy had a stroke? What's happened? And the man's just standing there. And he walks, the pastor walks back to him, brother, are you okay? He said, the Lord just told me, you are the finger you see, when we pray, when we pray for the laborers in the harvest field, as we pray that God will send someone, then we begin to realize, well, well, maybe I should go. You see, it's easy to pray and not get involved, but prayer should lead to involvement. Prayer should lead us to say, I I'm willing to get dirty. I'm willing to get in the mess of their lives to bring the gospel to them. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was a high-touch shepherd. He's, he's God. All he has to do is speak the word. All these people that he healed, he didn't have to touch them. Those, those lepers, that incredibly infectious disease, Jesus did not have to touch them to heal them. All he had to do was speak the word, be healed, and they would be healed. But if you read through the Gospels and see when Jesus was performing these miracles of compassion, he didn't just speak the word. He touched people. He was willing to get involved in the, in the mess of their lives. And then you notice in chapter 10, in that first verse, he got the disciples around him, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and affliction. Basically, he gave them authority to do the same thing he was doing. And then down in verse 5, he sent them out. Praying for the laborers didn't re release them from the obligation. They weren't to pray for laborers so that they could stay and hang around Jesus and hear the teaching and sing Kumbaya. That's, that's not why they were praying for laborers. 
Because he's sending them out as laborers. Don't, don't pray for anything you're not willing to do. Don't pray for God to send someone to reach your friend or your loved one if you're not willing to share the gospel with them. Don't pray. The old preacher said, when a farmer prays for a corn crop, God expects him to say amen with a hoe in his hand. Pray if you're not willing to do it. So he says what? Pray for the Lord of the harvest. Look at this. To send out laborers into his harvest field. You know what send out? The, the word send out is a very powerful word. It literally means to thrust out. And it's the same word that's used when Jesus cast a demon or demons out of someone. It's a powerful word. It means to thrust out. He's saying pray that the Lord of the harvest will shove some people out into the harvest field. Now, the workers, it's, it's two things there, the laborers. It'll be some new laborers that, that the Lord sends out. There'll be today, if, if you listen to the Spirit of God, there'll be today some of you who say, boy, it's time for me to get out in the harvest field. I've not done that before. So there'll be some new laborers that get sent out. But you know, the other thing is we pray for laborers to be sent in the harvest field as we pray for ourselves. It's also some workers who are already out in the field. They've been in the field, but they've turned back to worldly comforts. And we're praying that God shoves them or thrusts them back out, that he lights a fire under them to thrust them back out into a world of need. Can God not work with just a few laborers? Absolutely. He doesn't need us. Don't think you're the greatest thing that ever happened to evangelism. You're, you're God's gift to a lost world. He doesn't need us. Perhaps it's just that God doesn't want us to miss the blessing of going out in the fields with him. Pretty simple message. Let me give you some very clear application. Four questions. Number one, am I out and around people? I don't just mean that you're out in the community and, and shopping and getting gas and going to eat. I mean, are you like Jesus, it was a constant, unceasing effort to get around people and rub shoulders with people, hoping to have the opportunity to speak truth. Second, how's my vision? When you're out and around people and you're engaging the world, are you looking or are you seeing? Paul said, from now on, we regard no one from the worldly point of view. You may need to pray that Jesus gives you the kind of spiritual vision you need to have when you, when you look at people that you might see. Third, how's your compassion? Does the condition of people without Christ really disturb you? And does it disturb you enough, you're willing to get your hands dirty, you're willing to get messy, you're willing to get involved in their complicated life issues? because it disturbs you to not only see the condition they're in, but to know what eternity holds. Number four, are you praying? And as you pray, are you preparing? Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send more laborers into his harvest field. Doesn't release us from the responsibility. We, we want to pray for new workers. But we want to pray for those of us who already have been or should have been out in the harvest field.